blessing that we enjoy every day of our lives in that we are comforted, Father, that you are our Heavenly Father who looks after us. Lord, you are our provider. You are our strength, our comfort, our mighty foe. Lord, we thank you and we praise your name. Father, as we gather as a congregation to worship you, we pray, dear Lord, that we open our hearts and minds and we worship you in truth and spirit. Father, we pray for those of us who are not able to be here this evening. We ask, dear Lord, wherever they are, they're doing well and staying safe. Heavenly Father, please be with us throughout this hour. And we pray, dear Lord, all the acts of worship that we are involved in, that we be glorified in your name. In Jesus' name we offer this prayer. Amen. Worthy of praise is Brother Chambers, you are up. Well, good evening, everybody. It is wonderful, even on this uh, uh, this Sunday evening. It's wonderful that we are able to gather, even with the stay-at-home order in place. It's interesting to note that I've been working from home now for probably the better part of three weeks, almost a month. And the stories I hear are phenomenal. We have issues with coronavirus. We have high death rates. We have high infection rates. We have stay-at-home orders. And yet, it still seems the numbers go up and up and up. We live in a time right now that seems like a lot of people want to say, maybe we're in the end of days. Maybe maybe Jesus is ready to come. But we know when we go to the Bible, the Bible tells us that nobody knows that date. Nobody knows that time when he will come back. But no matter how bad we think we have it, no matter how difficult the situation seems to get, are we really being persecuted? Let's take a look at some people in the Bible, a, a particular person in the Bible that really was strongly persecuted. And I know we think we have it bad, but let's, let's look at somebody who really 
had it bad. And I'm talking about the character of Joe. I want to look and see just what it was like back in the first century, or well before the first century. Turn with me, if you would, in the book of Job to Job chapter 1. In Job chapter 1, we begin to see what kind of a person Job is to begin with. Beginning in verse 1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven, he, and seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 5,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was in the day of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Job, let's face it, Job is a rich man. He has got so many animals, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, a large house, and let's, let's, let's be realistic also. If you've got that many animals, you've got to have a lot of property also. So he's a rich man. But more than that, he was one that was blameless, upright. He was one that feared God and shunned evil. In all the land, he was the greatest. Let's continue on now and see where, where things start to go wrong for Job. Because so far, in the first five verses of this book, we see a man who's really got everything going very well for him. Verse 6, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a large hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Uh, we see We see that Satan has put a plan in motion. He, he says that Job is, is only right, righteously fearing God because God has built this hedge around him. That if God removes that hedge, if God reaches out and, and, and lays things open, that Job will curse him. Well, Let's see 
how Job actually responds when things really go wrong. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabaeans raided them and took them away, indeed they have killed all the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Ooh, pretty big loss there. 500 yoke of oxen, that's, now let's remember, a yoke of oxen is actually two oxen. So he's losing 1,000 oxes. He's losing 500 female donkeys to the, to the Sabaeans. And he's telling all the servants that have been watching these have been killed by the sword. Only this one servant has escaped to tell Job what has gone on. Verse 16 gets a little interesting, if you ask me. While he was still speaking, okay, so servant number, or messenger number one comes up, gives Job the news. All the oxen, all the donkeys, They've been raided, they've been taken away, the servants have been killed, I alone have escaped. While he is still speaking, another also came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed, consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. So now, not only is it the donkeys and the oxen, the sheep are all gone. Still, verse 17, while he was still speaking, again, a third messenger. Another came, another also came and said the Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels and took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. It just seems to be getting worse and worse and worse. The sheep are gone. The camels are gone. The oxen, the donkeys. It is not looking good for Job. He is suffering a financial blow. He's suffering a, a loss of property. He's suffering a loss of servants. There's loss of life every which way we turn. Verse 18. While he was still, yet another messenger, while he was still speaking, another also came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young people and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Wow. Now not only has he suffered this great, great loss of servants and of all his, his animals, all of his children are dead. All of this, one after the other. You could almost, you could almost see Job having a different response if he had been given a little bit of time between messengers. If he had had some time to absorb the, the impact of it all. But one after the other after the other, all of these servants come up and give them the news. Your oxen, your donkeys, your sheep, your camels, and now your children are all gone. And verse 20, and Job arose tore his robe, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and cursed God. No, he does not. He does not curse God even with all of this bad news, not with all of this horrendous information that he's just received. 
He tears his robe, he shaves his head, he falls to the ground and worships. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. I don't know if I would be strong enough to go through everything that Job has gone through and to remain so steadfast, so strong. But let's continue, because it's not over for Job yet. He's got a lot more coming. Chapter 2, verse 1, again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth? a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. And still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. So Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful oils from the soles of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a pot shard with which to scrape himself when he sat in the midst of the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish, uh, foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So, so far, Job, now and not has he lost only all of his property, all of his children. He's lost his health. He's covered with boils from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. I, I don't know. It's, it's really not looking good for him. He's, he's being persecuted by Satan, and he is just really suffering. I've, I've done work out in the yard. I've, I've, I've gone for you know long walks, stuff like that. Maybe my, my feet uh, didn't fit the shoes quite right. Maybe they weren't tied tight enough. You get a little, a little blister. Try walking with just a little blister. Try walking just even a few hundred yards. It's kind of painful, and that's only a small blister. But Job is covered with boils, covered with blisters from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. It's got to be miserable. Even his wife, even his wife here, uh, if, I, if I step back up slightly here and I go back up to verse 9 really quickly, he said, it says, then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Even with all this going on in his life, even with his, his children gone, his property gone, his, his, his animals gone, his servants gone, now even his health is gone, he still will not curse God. Job has a very difficult road ahead of him. Not only this, 
he's going to deplore his birth uh, when when we get to chapter three here. Uh, chapter 3, beginning in, in verse 1, after this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And Job spoke and said, may the day perish on which I was born. And the night in which it was said, a male child is conceived. May that day be darkness, may God above not seek it, nor the light shine upon it. May darkness and shadow of death claim it. May a cloud settle on it. May the blackness of the day terrify it. As for that night, may darkness seize it. May it not rejoice among the days of the year. May it not come into the number of the months. Oh, may that night be barren. May no joyful shout come into it. May those curse it who curse the day, those who are ready to arouse Leviathan. May the stars of its morning be dark. May it look for light but have none and not see the dawning of the day because it did not shut up the doors of my mother's womb nor hide sorrow from my eyes. Why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? Why did the knees receive me? Or why the breast that I should nurse? For now, I would have lain still and be quiet, been quiet. I would have been asleep. Then I would have been at rest. With kings and counselors of the earth who built ruins for themselves, or with princes who had gold who filled their houses with silver? Or why was I not hidden like a stillborn child, like infants who never saw light? There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary are at rest. There the prisoners rest together. They do not fear the voice of the oppressor. The small and great are there, and the servant is free from his master. Why is light given to him who is in misery, and life to the bitter of souls, who long for death, but it does not come and search for it more than hidden treasures, who rejoice exceedingly, and are glad when they can find the grave? Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden, and whom God has hedged in. For my sighing comes before I eat, and my groanings pour out like water. For the things I greatly fear has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, for trouble comes. Job is definitely feeling the pain. Job is definitely feeling the hard times. Brethren, in our lives, we are going to face good times. I remember very distinctly each day that all three of my daughters were born. Those days were wonderful. Those days were great. But days like we have now, days where we're all being told, stay at home, stay away from crowds, don't go out unless you absolutely have to, days in which we see abhorrent behaviors being rewarded, days in which we see 15 genders listed on employment forms. The times we live in right now are crazy. The times that we live in are on end. But brethren, we see better days ahead. We see rewards that we cannot even fathom the blessings that we will have. When this life ends and when we go to 
our, our heavenly home, what will that be like? What will we see? Will we have to deal with the things we deal now? No, not in heaven. For we know in heaven there will be no sin. There will be no pain, no sickness, no sorrow. We have better days coming. Job, Job had a difficult time. And Job's not the only character we see in the Bible. If we, if we had the time, we could go and see just what Christ went through with his mock trials, with his beatings, his scourging, carrying his own cross, being put on that cross, nailed to that cross, and being put to death. And for what? Did Christ ever do one thing wrong? No. I cannot think of even one thing ever that Jesus did. Especially nothing to be put to death for. We have strange days that we live through. We have strange times. But we have examples when even righteous, upright men will suffer. Not for anything they've done wrong. Not that the suffering is being put to them by God. But there are going to be times when we suffer. Currently, it is really difficult. When I think about my middle daughter and now having three children to raise on her own with the death of her husband. She's got a lot of hard times in front of her. But we know that we will be there for her. We will be there for her and her children. And God is there for us. God is there no matter what happens to us. We can be like the prodigal son. We can take our 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 inheritance, we can we can go out into a strange land, we can live wildly and crazy and we can do do things that we normally wouldn't. But then we come to our senses. And we try to return to the Father on our own terms, but really, if we look at the prodigal son, when he returned to his father, did he return on his terms or on the father's terms? Even with everything that he had done, the father welcomed him home. The father tells him to put a tells the servants to put a ring on his finger, put sandals on his feet. This son of his was dead and is now alive. The son didn't even get to go into his speech of I'm not even worthy to be called your son, just make me like one of your servants. That's what the that's what the son wanted to do. None of that happened. Brethren, we will get through this. Are we being persecuted directly? No. Is our society making it a little bit more difficult for us to meet? Yeah, that's the way it goes. But I'm thankful for people like Brother Brad, the elders there at Schomburg. They have found a way for us to still meet. They have found a way for us to still worship. And that is what is important. We are not being told by our government that we cannot worship. We're not being told that we are going to be thrown in prison for worshiping. That went on in the first century. But we are being told to stay at home to limit the spread of the virus. It does seem to be working. Uh, I do hope for for sanity's sake, I, I hope it's not too much longer. Uh, 
like I said, looking, staring at these four walls for too long. Maybe I will go a little bit crazy, but it'll be worth it in the end. We still need to stay faithful. We still need to stay strong. We still need to focus on God. As long as we focus on God, we will get through no matter what. No matter how dark the day seems, no matter how difficult the times, if we focus on God, we will survive and we will have our reward in heaven. I know we normally want to bring forth the invitation. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly, Brad, how you're going to do that. But um, we need to understand that if there's anyone on that's not a Christian, anyone listening to the message this evening, we need to be Christians. To partake in that reward of heaven, we need to be Christians. We need to hear the word. We need to understand the word. Upon hearing that word, we need to ask ourselves some, some serious questions. Because if we believe that word, we then need to repent. And repentance is so important. Repentance is turning away from that which we do, which is contrary to God's will and to God's teaching. In this world, there's a lot of things that are contrary to God's will. Some of the some of the biggest industries we have in the in the in the world are alcohol, tobacco, pornography. All of these are against God's will. But what we need to understand is if we engage in these, we need to repent. We need to change that behavior. We need to turn away from them. As we turn away from them, we need to confess Jesus before men, because if we confess Jesus before men, we will then, he will then confess us before the Father. Upon that confession, we need to be baptized. Baptism is not optional. We need to be baptized. We need to we need to have our sins washed away. Because every single one of us has sinned. Every single one of us has fallen short of the glory of God. And as as such, we need to have those sins washed away. We do that in the waters of baptism. Upon being baptized, we need to rise from those waters. We need to live faithful, obedient lives to Christ. If we stay obedient to Christ, we will partake in that final reward, that final resting place. We will go to heaven. We will have a home where there is no night. There is no shadow, no turning. Where there is only good things. As I said earlier, in heaven, there will not be any sorrow. There will not be any tears. There will not be any any heartache, no sickness, no death. That's what we all need to look for. As I bring this message to an end this evening, all I want to say is it is such a blessing to be with all of you, not only this evening, but every Sunday. To be with each and every one of you, to, to hear your voices, to see your faces, to, to see Brad at Mission Control. Wonderful thing. Wonderful thing. Brethren, are we all doing that which we know we need to do? Are we all being faithful to God? Let us now go to the invitation song.
Thank you, Brother Chambers, for that wonderful message. When we build our foundation on Christ, we will never be lost. We will um, always be secure in that. Uh, Job had his foundation in God. So even when he lost everything, he still found himself having his relationship with God. When we find ourselves in this world, if everything else should leave us and we have our foundation in Christ, we are still amongst the richest in the world. Uh, it's, it's so very important because we know that that's a foundation that will never go away. So thank you again, Brother Bob. And answering your question, again, how we are handling um, if someone does want to uh, uh, come to us and be baptized. For anyone out there um, who might be listening to this on Facebook after the fact or YouTube after the fact, please contact us. We will meet you um, at the Sharmar Church of Christ, and we will um, help you, and we will help you obey that gospel. So please don't let the, uh, these times stop you from doing so, stopping from making the best decision that you could possibly make. Um, I will pass on the mic. Are there any announcements before we close out this evening? I'm not seeing any hands being raised. Oops. If you're trying to unmute Brother Shoresh, I did not allow it. One second. Go ahead. Uh, who does the closing prayer? Uh, please uh, remember a uh, sister, Sir Marco, um, as she's traveling to see her dad. I believe that is Brother Viglatoro, uh, who has the closing prayer. Yes. Um, Sister Smarco's father is not doing well. She's going to go visit him. So uh, she would definitely uh, need our prayers as long as, uh, along with Bert Estes. If there is nothing else, then I'm going to unmute you, Brother Vilgatoro, and will you please close us out? Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer at this time, thanking you for this opportunity to be together as the brethren uh, assembling even separately, but not in, a, not in a building at this time, uh, to worship you, sing songs and praises, and and uh, listening to a sermon, O oh Lord. O oh Lord, we ask uh, that you forgive us of our sins. We pray for those who are sick, that they will be healed. And once again, we will be together next Lord's Day and on Wednesday to learn more about your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to go ahead, again, leave the mic open as we do afterwards. Uh, please uh, enjoy. Hi, please enjoy. <laughs> hey, sister. How are you? Uh, I am doing well with still a full belly following lunch. 